Hey guys, I want to thank you for taking time to watch this midweek message from Union Baptist Church in Hamptonville. Uh, I'm so grateful for that. Uh, I'm grateful also we had a great Sunday this past Sunday as we were able to meet outside and recognize all of our graduates uh, from all different ages and levels. And Pastor Travis preached a strong, a good message that I know encouraged them and all of us as we were out there. Uh, and it was just a good day all the way around. Uh, I just want to mention a couple of things to you. This Sunday, we'll meet, be back inside. We'll meet at 9 a.m. Uh, for worship. And then uh, we'll meet again at 10.30 to give plenty of room and plenty of space to everybody. So I hope everyone will feel comfortable enough to come on back out and worship with us at both those opportunities. Uh, and, and, and let's just enjoy the Lord together. Uh, also, that night on Sunday night, this coming Sunday night at 6 p.m., Nathan Trivet is going to be uh, speaking during our worship service on Sunday night at 6 and he's going to be talking about and I know it'll be a challenge to all of us about soul winning uh, about being accountable about the importance of sharing our faith and sharing sharing the word in whatever means possible and and uh, so it just want to give you a special invite to come and hear Nathan and to hear what uh, the Lord might say through him and then the next week the 22nd through the 24th our youth are going to be meeting we've had a Kind of a challenging year with with camps and uh, we had a mission trip planned uh, and it was it was uh, canceled due to the the virus and all the stipulations and everything so our youth are meeting next week in the activity center they're going to kind of three do three nights together up there the 22nd through the 24th and uh, i know that uh, they'll be encouraged by everything that's done just the fellowship being together hanging out together and uh, listen to what Pastor Travis and Diana have to say about uh, as they teach the scriptures. Uh, last Wednesday night, I started to uh, begin to talk about uh, God's upside down kingdom. And what I meant by that is uh, certainly the paradoxes that oftentimes are in the kingdom of God. Uh, for example, last week we talked about out of Matthew chapter 18 about how to be great in God's family. Uh, we talked about humility. Uh, we talked about how important that that was and how that uh, the Bible reminds us that God exalts us when we humble ourselves before him. But we also talked about before honor comes humility and how important that is. So to go high, you got to go low. That's kind of a paradox. It's, it's certainly countercultural. And, and certainly what I think we're going to be looking at tonight also is, is countercultural. As we get to talk about uh, finding strength out of our weakness. Uh, and looking at a, a, a familiar passage, I think, at a second uh, Corinthians chapter number 12. Um, and I want to read the first 10 verses there. Uh, and I think that you'll put all this together when we think about how that God's greatest power is revealed in our lives through our weakest times, through our most challenging circumstances in life. Listen to what the scripture says in second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Paul said, it's not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such a one called up to the third heaven. I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was called up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I should not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, the Lord said unto him, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am I strong. I was thinking about uh, a title for this message, and I, I, I think one that is very accurate is to just simply talk about today's difficulties are tomorrow's testimonies. 
I think we see that in the life of Paul. Certainly we see this in this principle that he talks about and what the Lord taught him uh, about in his weakness, God's strength is made perfect. Uh, one of my favorite stories that I've read and came across in a long time, I was reminded of in, uh, out of a devotional that I read some time ago uh, online uh, by Chuck Swindoll. He talked about Vance Havner in Vance Havner's book, uh, It Is Toward Evening. And in that book, it tells the story of a group of farmers who are raising cotton in the deep south where the devastating boll weevil invaded the crops. These men had, had put all their savings, dedicated all of their fields, and all set all their hopes on having a good crop of cotton. And then the boll weevil came, and before long, it looked like they were all headed to the poorhouse. But farmers, being the determined and ingenious people that they are, decided, well, we can't plant cotton anymore, so we're gonna plant peanuts. And amazingly, these peanuts brought them more money than they would have ever made raising cotton. And when the farmers realized that what originally seemed like a disaster had actually proved to be a boon, and this is what they did. They set up a large and impressive monument to the boll weevil, and a monument to the one thing that they once thought would destroy them. And listen to what Vance Havner said. He said, sometimes we settle into a humdrum routine as monotonous as growing cotton year after year. And then God sends the boll weevil. He jolts us out of our groove and we must find new ways to live. Financial reverses, bereavement, physical infirmity, loss of position. How many have been driven uh, by trouble to be better husbandmen and to bring forth far better fruit from their souls. The best thing that could ever happen to some of us is, is the coming of our own boll weevil. I thought about that story and I thought, man, does it fit in this particular passage of Scripture and certainly in the life of the Apostle Paul as we think about what he's talking about. This paradox that we see here in God's upside-down kingdom that out of our weakness, God's great strength is revealed. And sometimes I would even go so far as to say only out of our weakness, God's power is revealed. Never revealed out of our pride, never revealed out of our boastfulness, never revealed out of our selfishness or self-centeredness, but only out of our weakness does the Bible say God's power and God's glory is revealed. When we are at our weakest, that is when we find God to be the strongest. Did you hear me? That's the paradox. That's the truth. That's what this apostle found out. When we are at our weakest, God himself proves to be the strongest. Now, let me just give you a little background about this particular event in the Apostle Paul's life. He describes it as 14 years ago. He had an experience through visions of revelation that he was called up to the third heaven. Now, certainly when he talks about the third heaven, he's talking about actually paradise itself. He's talking about that he himself was transported to the abode of God and was able to see and experience things that man should not be able to see and experience. And certainly... He received, because of this, uh, certainly, I think, to keep him humble. In fact, that's what he said. He said, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, or in other words, through what he experienced and what he was able to see, uh, he received a, a thorn in the flesh. He referred to it as a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So there's a lot of things happening here in this text. In talking about the thorn of the flesh that's been debated by Bible scholars and, and commentators for such a long time. I, I know that some have debated on whether it was just incessant temptation. Some have debated on whether it was uh, people that were constantly trying to dog him and persecute him and undo the message, undo the gospel that he was trying to preach. Whether it was a chronic, some type of chronic sickness. Whether it was a, a, a speech impediment. Uh, I think that certainly, based on what he said in, in Galatians chapter 4, verse number 13, that it was something physical, that it was something that tormented him. Uh, that word buffet literally means to drive a stake through. So it was something that he viewed as an impediment for him to spread the gospel, to be the missionary and the church planner that he, that he uh, felt like God had called him to be. In other words, he didn't want any part of it. And that's the reason that the Bible tells us 
that three times that he pleaded with the Lord that this thorn, this, this physical malady, this problem would be removed. In fact, he said it was a messenger of Satan. I like what John MacArthur in his uh, study Bible said. He said, as was Job, Satan was the immediate cause, but God was the ultimate cause. Uh, aren't you glad that God can take what Satan means for us as evil and he can turn it into good? Oh, that's the good news. And that's what God used in Paul's life, I believe, to take him to a different level of experiencing the grace of God in a powerful way. He prayed about it. Uh, he'd ask God to remove it. So you see, God doesn't always answer our prayers the way we think that he should. Uh, sometimes God certainly says no to some things that we ask him about. Certainly he told Paul no, but I want you to know, he not, didn't just tell him no. But he also he had some things to teach him. He had a message for him to get in his mess. In his mess, God had a message for him. And something he wanted him to see and something he wanted him to hear. So just like last week we talked about humility being countercultural. This particular subject we're talking about tonight, weakness and brokenness, is countercultural because we don't like weakness. That's perceived uh, in a wrong way in our culture today. Oftentimes, maybe it's even perceived that way in the church. We don't want anything to do that will make us weak, anything to do that will be perceived as weak. But yet, the Bible teaches us that in our weakness, God's strength is made perfect. And that's the application of this event. That's the lesson that Paul had to learn here in the text. Because the Lord gave him a, a personal message and told him that my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Uh, Paul delivered, received this message from the Lord very clearly. Simply put, divine power is best displayed on the backdrop of weakness. So I think there were some lessons that Paul had to learn about this as we think about this particular paradox that out of our weakness, God gives us divine strength. When we are our weakest, when we are our lowest, God has the capacity to reveal himself to us as well as to others in a greater way, I think more in a greater way than he ever could when we're on top of the mountain. And that's what Paul found out. Because when Paul came to an end of himself, Christ alone was seen in his life. When we get to the end of ourself, then that's when Christ is magnified. And sometimes that's at our very weakest point. So when we think about this principle, that even today's difficulties can be tomorrow's testimonies, think about what Paul is talking about. I believe, first of all, we understand from this text that there is always a continual supply of grace. There is always a continual supply of grace. If you look at the phrase and the word that, that the Lord gave to Paul, he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Now, if you notice the text there where it says is sufficient, that's in present tense. That means that presently, for whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, there's always going to be enough grace to enable you to handle it. If God doesn't bring you out of it, he's going to get you through it no matter what that situation is. So it's present tense grace. And that's the way grace works, isn't it? The Bible says in Hebrews 4 and verse number 16, in talking about the throne of grace, and in the context it talks about us drawing near to God in prayer and bringing our needs before the Lord, bringing ourselves before the Lord. Why is that? So we might find mercy and obtain grace to help in time of need. Grace is... It would appear to me that the scripture teaches this, and it would appear to me from my own personal experience, grace is always present tense. In other words, it's God meeting us in our situation, sometimes even in our mess, even in our unpleasantness, and providing us what exactly we need at that moment in time. See, you can't store it up. I know there's a lot of people gardening. I know there's a lot of people that do a lot of canning, and they're canning beans, and they're canning tomatoes, and they're canning corn, and all these different things. But, you know, you can't do that with grace. It'd be nice to bottle up or can up some grace and put it on the shelf and then pull it down when you think you need it. But that's not the way grace works because grace is present tense. And when God told Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee, what he meant was here in this thorn that you want to be removed, I'm not going to remove it. I'm not going to take it away. But what I am going to give you is sufficient grace 
that you'll be able to enable, that will enable you to handle whatever comes your way. And then it's going to make you not only enable to handle it, but it's going to make you more usable in these days and in the future. So there's always a continual supply of grace. But I want you to know something else that Paul realized that I think we need to, we need to get sometimes, and it's this truth. He saw difficulties as an avenue to experience God's grace. Now, when you read this, and you read the text, and you read where Paul said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. And then later on he says, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessity and all the things. You, you may get the idea that he just was some type of sadistic person and enjoyed pain and enjoyed difficulty. I don't think anybody does that. And I don't think that's what the scriptures uh, is implying what, to what Paul is saying. But I do think that it does mean he began to look at infirmities, necessities, persecutions, reproaches. He began to look at them completely different than he did before he learned this lesson from the Lord about sufficient grace and strength in his weakness. He saw difficulties as an avenue to experience God's grace. Because when he experienced weakness, when he got to the end of himself, he experienced something that he didn't experience at any other time. You see, when we get to the end of ourselves, you might even want to say to the end of our robes, what happens is this. We experience divine power that will encircle us and empower us. I love the imagery in this text where Paul said that the power of Christ may rest upon you. That word rest literally means to tabernacle. So in our weakness, God's power rests upon us and, and shrouds us and infuses us with strength to handle whatever that we're going through. God's power does that. And he didn't enjoy difficulties. No one enjoys them. But he, his perspective had changed. And listen, transforming grace does that. It helps us to see things differently. It, it helps us to not run away in fear. But to say, by God's grace, I can handle this. And that's what Paul learned. That God's strength was perfected in his weakness. You see, there's always a continual supply of grace. Difficulties open the door to experience God's power. But I think thirdly, the last thing I want to share with you is no matter how old you are, how long you've been saved, there's always lessons to learn. I think sometimes uh, in the church, and I've been in the church, I've been a pastor for some 35 years, and I've been in a church most of my life. And I think sometimes as Christians, we kind of walk around like we've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Like there's nothing left for us to learn, nothing left for us to know. But I believe that the Christian life is always a series of new beginnings. It's always, it's like riding a bicycle. Unless you're going forward, you're going backwards or you stop. And oftentimes the way we go forward is learning lessons from the Lord, even through difficulty and even through victory. But I have to be honest with you, and I know you will probably agree with me. We learn a lot more through trial and difficulty than we ever do through victory and being on top of the mountain. That's when we get to experience God's transforming grace through our difficulty and through our, our, our trouble. you got to be teachable. you got to be teachable. And what I mean by that is, is, you know, he said, Lord, remove this thing from me. And the Lord spoke to him and said, listen, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. In your weakness, my strength is made perfect. So I believe God gives us wisdom. He gives us enablement. He gives us what we need when we need it. And that's what grace really is. And in fact, I think another word that would explain Paul's experience here is just simply brokenness. Brokenness. Uh, Paul saw brokenness as a friend. And sometimes when we talk about brokenness, sometimes I think when I mention brokenness to folks in, in the context of the local church, they, they think about being broken and beaten and being devastated without any hope whatsoever. You may get the image of a face that's broken to pieces. I know the Bible reminds us that a broken and contrite spirit that God will not despise. So what does it mean to be broken? What does it mean when you get to the point of your lowest point in that weakness? And then, then when we get there, God's strength lifts us up. Well, I think this illustration fits it pretty well. It gives us an understanding of what I think that we get to the point where Paul, we can apply this principle to our, to our life. Brokenness is kind of like a cowboy breaking a horse. And when the horse isn't broken, it's always trying to throw that cowboy off. Always trying to buck off whomever's on his back. 
But once that horse reaches the place of brokenness, the horse surrenders to the rider. And that rider can guide that horse with bit in its mouth wherever that he wants it to go. When we're broken before the Lord, and we quit resisting him, and we quit fighting against him, and we get struggling, we quit struggling with him. We realize we get to this point that Paul was at when we understood. He began to look at his weaknesses and his struggles and his difficulties in a different way. And he began to understood, understand that in his weakness, God's grace is perfected. God's strength is perfected, even when we're broken before him. So to be broken before the Lord is to stop resisting him, stop fighting him, and surrender to him. I don't know what you may be going through. I really don't know where you are in your life. But I do know God's grace is enough for you. We've all experienced those gut punches in life. We've all, whether it be through betrayal or bereavement or some of those things that even Vance Haver was talking about, uh, we know what that's like. Most all of us do. And oftentimes we fight against that instead of just surrendering and submitting and just, just calling out to the Lord that he would become more real to us. And even in our suffering and our difficulty knowing that God's strength is made perfect through all of that. Just another thing that's kind of countercultural to what we see around us. I would encourage you that if you're one of God's children, if you're a part of Union Baptist Church or, or any other church, the greatest thing that you could ever do is surrender your life 100% to the Lord Jesus Christ. Stop fighting Him. Stop wrestling with Him. Learn the lesson of Jacob in the Old Testament. When we surrender, when we give in to the Lord, we win. We win when we surrender. And our walk is never, ever the same again. Maybe you're listening and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. You realize, I hope you do, God loves you. Jesus Christ died for your sin and rose again that you might have eternal life. And if you don't have that assurance in your heart of eternal life, would you call out on his name and ask him to save you? Just say something like, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to save me and forgive me of my sin. And I promise that I'm going to live for you. You just pray that in Jesus' name. And I want you to know something. That doesn't automatically mean your trouble is going to go away. You might wake up in the morning with the same set of troubles you had when you went to sleep the night before. But I do promise you this. You have the abiding presence of Almighty God that will be with you and will never leave you. Because he's just that God. He's the God who said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. All in our weakness, his strength is made perfect. And I tell you, I don't know what I'm going to face tomorrow, but this much I do know. I know that his grace will be sufficient for it. And it will be for you too. So let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for this evening. Thank you as, as we are here on, on this hump day during this week. I pray for churches as they're gathering. I pray for our prayer meeting. I'm praying, God, that those that are watching this through Facebook or YouTube, I pray that, God, they might be encouraged by the Holy Spirit. And, God, they'd be lifted up. And we just pray that you'd save the lost and reclaim that struggling, backslidden soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.